Every day, ordinary people make extraordinary choices as they negotiate unpredictable pathways to the peak of their expectations without ever taking the time to enjoy the view. Join me, Tish Tyndall, at this panoramic viewpoint of astonishing personal and professional progress as we find out why my next guest is living the fabulous life. Harriet Thorpe, thank you so much for joining me. I cannot believe you are joining me tonight. Where are you, in London, darling? Yes, I am, darling. And I'm in Lossy Mouth. The what magic of Zoom. The magic of Zoom, <laughs> darling. Life-changing. And you must be the busiest woman in show business. You never well, stop. I, <laughs> I've been very lucky in this hideous, bizarre and you know, frightening time. I've been very lucky to be the first show back at Wembley Arena with Sleepless. Yep. And right now I'm filming. So yeah, I'm very lucky. And I'm very lucky that you've decided to join me this evening because I know you were filming last night during the night. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for that. Darling, darling the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> now, listen, you do everything. You act, you sing, you dance, you present, you teach, you do everything. How is it even <laughs> possible that you are some sort of superhero? You know, wh where do you get the energy? I love working. I love my job. And I was thinking today, it's so hard without theatre at the moment and the arts are so crushed at this time. But we have needed the arts in the human race forever. Whether it's Greek tragedy or Shakespeare or painting on the caves, we need the arts. And when you're in it, as you are indeed, and you know, you don't have a choice. And I just say yes to everything. And, but you give everything, you're everything. <laughs> and that's the thing about you. You know, you, you, you are an enormous inspiration to so many people and and you know if i mention your name to anybody they all go oh i love her you know she was fantastic and so everybody knows you they know who you are i mean you are you're you're just one of the of britain's most loved um actresses but you're not just an actress you're a singer and a dancer and you're equally fabulous at all of that you know how 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 do you do that what happens to make that happen well, as I said, I love my job. I was at the Royal Ballet School when I was 16 until my, can I say the word tits? Yes, you can say tits. Thank you, darling. You're most um, welcome. Until, yeah, thank you. Until my tits grew and they were never getting into a tutu. It's never going to happen. So then I went to Rombert, which is a contemporary dance school, and uh, 1718. And then I realised kind of dance wasn't for me, but the feeling to communicate, to express, to be creative is in there. It doesn't matter whether you write, play an instrument, paint, the feeling to yeah. express is there. So then I went to drama school and luckily because I can dance a bit and I'm an actress who sings and a bit and I always play psychotic people, as you know, they're never remotely normal, darling. Um, they're either Madame Tenardier or Madame Morrible. I mean, you know, just take your pick, Tanya. Um, and so I, I, love, I love my job. And so working or creating it, if I haven't got a job, I'll make one because that's how my DNA is and how I'm hardwired. And it fulfills me and it makes me feel better. But you know, because you're the same, you're creative. You are an amazing songwriter and performer yourself. You know that stuff. Yes, I do know it but the thing is you're telling me you're an actress who sings no i disagree you are a fabulous singer and you're you, also darling. a fabulous dancer i have seen this <laughs> witnessed it <laughs> what do you think i know it's the feeling and i know that regardless of the expression and the type of the expression I know that it should be there, but it isn't always there. But with you, Harriet, it is there in everything that you do. That feeling, that totally focused fabulousness is always there. Is there a secret to that? And could you please tell me? Of course, darling. Um, I think the thing is, we can choose how we feel. 
And when somebody first told me that, I really wanted to punch their lights out. It was so irritating. I was mm -hmm. thinking, you don't understand. I'm, I've got so many problems. And then I thought, actually, I could just be okay. And I make that choice to be okay. I make that choice. You know, people think of performers as superficial. You know, we're not doing brain surgery in a children's hospital. But we're there for everyone when they want to escape. And so we don't always want to perform eight shows a week. Can we? Absolutely, yes, because we make that choice. We choose to be okay. We choose to do that thing. And I choose to do that, whether I'm doing charity stuff or whatever. I choose to do it because I feel better when I do it. It's as simple as that. Make a choice. <laughs> and, you know, if it works for you to be anxious, stressed, I mean, there are things. Of course, life is stressful. There are terrible things that happen in life. But there's a moment of choice when, for the moment you are creative, you are okay. When it's, that's how, you, who, how and who you are, then make a choice to be okay. Crack a smile, get on with it, and you'll feel better. Yes, without a doubt. And I think everybody who watches you and listens to you feels better, Harry. And, and that's something that I find completely compelling because you are a human being who puts other human beings at at you know at ease your performances allow us to enjoy the performance it's never something that you're you're uneasy about because you know that when Harriet Thorpe does her thing you know she's going to her, do her thing in such a fabulous way that that everything is going to be okay and when I read your reviews and and you know some of your reviews are are exceptional and you Thank know you. especially for the supporting actress parts you know and I know from talking to other people who have worked with you that that they want you to be the supporting actress because you give them that thing that energy do you think that comes from being around the business a lot you know I know that your mum and dad were involved your sister is involved your son is involved um, in the business is this something that you think is is in your blood is it in your genes to be to be think, hard working and fabulous I think thank you for that um, I think that I think that the thing that's important is that the creative world I mean, don't get me wrong, there are arseholes everywhere, but the creative world is an accepting one. And in essence, everyone is included. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, we want to be together. Communication is everything. And therefore, I'm lucky that I come from a, my mother was a writer, wrote some very important books. Um, and later, one of her books was made into a film. That started a movie career, which is why I grew up in L.A. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my father was an actor from a child. At 14, he left home during the war and went to work with Italia Conti, touring England. Um, mm -hmm. And then eventually went to Rada. Um, and then sensibly probably stopped. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think I'm lucky enough to have that background where everyone is accepted. It doesn't matter. I, when I grew, was growing up, I didn't understand racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism. It wasn't in my world. Everything, everything was normal. And it was only when I stepped out of my world into school, into life, that people were judgmental and and all those things, homophobic, racist, anti-Semitic, everything. And I think that's why our culture of the arts is so important because it's inclusive and you don't have to be from the arts to join it. It's where you're led by your talent and your instinct to communicate in whatever way that you do. And it's a great leveller, isn't it? You know, any medium, any art form is a great leveller because, like you say, we can all appreciate it. You know, mm. the, the, the communication of it is, is quite something. Do you think you were always a brilliant communicator? You know, as a child, were you really good at communicating? I think so. I think I always made my um, needs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think my parents always knew what I wanted. Um, but my earliest memory is trying to make my sister laugh. And that feeling when she did was so wonderful. 
and I think you just you know it's not a normal thing we should all be in a home probably it's a bit mad <laughs> uh, and you know that's one thing I wanted to say to you because I am I've been lucky enough to enjoy some fabulous conversations with you where we just laugh a lot mm -hmm. and you are naturally funny but you're also exceptionally good at at delivering the gag line you know your de your your delivery of comedy um is wonderful what do you think it takes to be able to do that well again it's kind of a sound and a feeling and it's about the character and whatever that character would do and the looks and the i i did a show called the brutus empire which was a sitcom for about seven years and when i first read the first script it said this character carol who lives in, uh, lives in the reception, she works in reception and sports centre, in a leisure centre, um, but she lives in the reception unbeknownst to most people. Her kids are in the drawers and the cupboards and things. And um, it says she cries all the time. And I thought, that's quite a small journey to cry all the time. So I thought trying not to cry is so much more expansive because vocally, Sometimes you're really, really hard. Sometimes you're really low to slow down. You know, there's that sound. And I also remember she said, it said that she adored the boss of the, of the leisure center, Mr. Brutus. And I remember being a little girl at school and adoring my teacher who was the most glamorous, charismatic person. And you know that thing in schools when people say, now class, who knows the answer? <laughs> you can't say the word fast, fast enough, you can't. And that's how I said Mr. Brutus was just, yes, <laughs> Yes, she loved him so much she couldn't say it. So those little things, creating characters and doing those things are, are just an absolute joy. And I think the involvement and connection with all of that and humour gives you the dynamic and the rhythm. And in Absolutely Fabulous, of course, um, Jen and I were at drama school together. We've known each yeah. other for 40 fly years, whatever. And... Um, I decided the girls were really, really sort of airheady, and I decided to give my character a really weak R. So then she began to write lots of things with R's in. So, you know, it's those things that give you your comic timing with each character because you, it's about the imagination and the text. And then you put them all together and, and have a smorgasbord of choice. You know, character is everything. And that gives you the platform and the springboard to work with. And so would you say that that's what you are then, a character actress? I mean, Absolutely. I don't think there's anything about acting that doesn't have a character, but, you know, that term, would you identify with that? Yes, I would. I mean, I think, you know, yes, 100%. I, as I said, I always play people who are psychotic. They're never normal. If I'm doing Shakespeare, I'm either some old girl is a bit like that or I'm some terrible queen who's killing a king. You know, it's, it's that, you know, if I'm, you know, I, I'm never anybody normal. They're always mad and I love it and I wouldn't want to do anything else. And so when you sing then, you know, cause you're telling me that you're an actress who sings and I happen to know differently, um, <laughs> you know, do you employ the same tactics when you Absolutely. are? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. When I was doing Madame Tenardier, I remember saying I, because, when I read the novel, it says Madame Tenardier reads romantic novels, mm -hmm. which means she's literate mm -hmm. and she has romance and she has mm -hmm. desire and she lives in this squalid, depressing, yeah. despairing place. And so I thought, I, I remember saying to her wonderful wig lady, please can I have hair that's like she's henned it to hell, you know, that it's like she's just put her finger in a socket and her hair standing on end can i have on my belt because you have, obviously it's a set uh, costume um yeah. but can i have chains on my belt i said to the wardrobe people and on the chains madame Tenardier would keep everything she has because her life is about taking things and stealing and surviving yeah. i want certain things chained so it was a terrible mirror it was a battered fan Again, so this is her, uh, her sort of attempt at glamour. So creating her that way, I had a little novel that was again chained to her because it, those things gave her her life and they all went in the pockets. Now, half the time I didn't even use them, but knowing they were there, that yeah. was the woman who arrives at the end in that grotesque dress with the terrible makeup. She's never <laughs> felt happier. 
<laughs> but that is the idea of even though you're stepping into the shoes of amazing people who've done the role before little nuances like that yeah. give you the reason to she's a she abuses a child yet she's a yeah. funny character yeah. that's not yeah. funny so again yes. i made my own decisions about why she couldn't look after that child properly and it it enabled me to be funny even in this most despairing time when she throws her into the dark you know it's those things those choices in the text give you yes it's all about those character choices and the text is everything isn't it i mean everything, everything. is in there for you absolutely well not always actually <laughs> <laughs> I've done several shows where the text isn't there, but then there's even more joy because you have even more fun. Yeah. yeah, and that's the other thing about you. You know, your improvisational <laughs> skills are are second to none. Where do you think the the drive to um, to be able to deliver everything comes from? That's an interesting question. I think I don't know. I think part of that is growing up in a ballet world where you have to be you're never good enough so you're always trying to perfect something and when you're dealing with something like Shakespeare or um, Sondheim you're never going to be better than that work no. so it keeps you reaching always to match its brilliance to try and every day add some little thing to to give you a different facet so i think that's the drive sometimes the text is better than you can ever be ever mm -hmm. and that's the thing that thrills you and makes you reach for more and when it isn't there the fun of creating something and going on to make it better is equally as fulfilling that gives me the drive you know you you are so you're you're such an inspiration and i and I, I don't want you to take that lightly what i mean is you're so full of joy and experience and a love of what you do that is mixed up with wonderful technique and creativity and musicality you know was there ever a time when you couldn't find that harriet was there a time in your career where you thought i just can't bring that no i don't think you think like that because it's not helpful I mean, a critic may decide they don't like you, but you know what? It's not my business. Not everyone is going to like you, and that's okay. Because if you're defined by one thing in life, then without it, you are nothing. So we can't be defined by anything. It has to be everything. And, you know, we can't be defined by one person, one play, one anything. And have you always enough. felt like that? Have you always felt like you, that? No, I think you learn it. I remember mm -hmm. I was doing a wonderful play at the Royal Exchange directed by Marianne Elliott with a fantastic part and an amazing cast. And one day I found myself sobbing in the ladies' loo thinking I wasn't good enough. And then I realised and remembered I lost a lot of my friends in the AIDS epidemic. And as I was doing my self-indulgent sobbage, I thought, you know, maybe I could just be okay and not give myself a hard time because I'm here and I can enjoy this. Why don't I make a, you know, we have this rule book for, of life. We all do. This is how I do this. And I can't, if I do it any other way, no, this is my way. No, we can throw that rule book. There are things in life that we evolve as we learn to survive that are very helpful at certain points in our life. And then there's times when we can look at it and think, that doesn't work for me today. I can let go of that and embrace something new and not to be afraid. Because I think the thing that holds us back all the time is that we are not enough. And we have to know that we are enough. We don't have to be best, be first, be chosen. This is not a race. There is no winning post. And that's why you once said to me, there is no job too small. Never. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and that's the, that's the thing about you, you know, you just bring such warmth and a wealth of experience to everything that you do. When you look back, Harriet, at, at mm -hmm. it all at this moment, you know I, know, I know the answer to this question, I think, but I want to ask you, if you were to look mm -hmm. back, and what, what would you say was fabulous about you? 
Well, you know, again, what, that's an interesting question because we know what's fabulous about everybody else, but we don't know what's fabulous about ourselves. I think that um, I love a laugh and I love, to, I love having a good time with friends and having a laugh is everything, whether things are good or bad. And you, Harriet Thorpe, bring that to our worlds every day in everything that you do. Um, and I am absolutely overjoyed that you were able to, you know, find some time to talk to me today because you really are a huge inspiration. You are somebody who so many people look up to, including myself. So, Harriet, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me on this show because you really are living the fabulous life. Harriet, thank you so much. My pleasure. Although I may be a child of the 60s, there's still a life in me. Unquestionably fabulous events. <laughs> I may be older, but not yet in orbit. I'm harnessed by some feisty gravity. With my feet firmly on the ground, you get more value to the pound when you put your trust in someone with an aging USP. Like the ladies who are fabulous at 50, or sensational. Here's to the 70s who plan to spend their 80s Building a rocket ship to take them to the moon When they retire With maturity there comes a little mm, extra A fabulous je ne sais quoi The kind of comfort and appeal You only get when something's real More quality and luxury Yes, by far I've been around for generations. I've added to the population. I think it's time I led the nation in a song of jubilation that will celebrate the women who are fabulous at 40 plus. Yes! <laughs> That's next for me. <laughs> when I turned 50, I was told to sort out my will and get a free pen, go on a cruise, do some baking. I'd rather eat my own foot off. Just like the ladies who are fabulous at 50 and sensationally smashing 65. Here's to the 70s who plan to spend their 80s building a rocket ship to take them to the moon when they retire. <laughs> Here's to the ladies who are fabulous at 50 and sensationally smashing 65. To the 70s who plan to spend their 80s Building a rocket ship to take them to the moon When they retire Yes, that's next for me <laughs> That's next for me Wanna come along? That's next for me <laughs> That's next for me I think my rocket's going to be silver